Welcome to the We Are Libertarians Book Club. I'm Hody Johns. I am uh, a member. I'm here with uh, Hadley, Dale, and Chris Spangle, all your favorite people. How are you guys doing? Well, doing great. Awesome. We all got our uh, post-church look going on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, so uh, we got to discuss Liberty's First Crisis this month. And uh, wow, for me, what an eye opener. Uh, definitely shattered a lot of the illusions I have for the uh, founding fathers. Uh, what were some of your, uh, what are your initial thoughts? Like it, hate it? Uh, Hadley, let's start with you, man. Uh, I loved it. Uh, it was quite the eye opener. Um, I think my view was much more rose colored glasses of the first years of the uh, Republic. And finding out that literally, I think it was 12 or 13 years in after ratifying the Constitution, the Federalists are already null and void in the First Amendment. So it was quite um, educational on that end, something that I never even, I'd heard sort of the Alien Sedition Act, but never heard any or knew anything of it. So I think I, I loved it. I look forward to speaking about it. Yeah. How about you, Chris? You can take as much time as you'd like, because uh, I know you got to leave early. So how'd you feel about it? I was surprised that the two major issues of you know, so, some of the first Congresses were restricting uh, immigrants and arguing over whether or not immigrants should be involved in the Republic and how do we restrict free speech. And so I have not read this since December, January. Um, so I'm a little bit fuzzy on some of it, but I just was so struck. Like you, you really only even need to read like the first ten percent of the book or the first you know couple chapters to get the the real gist of it. Where you have troublemakers in Congress uh, and they want to restrict their abilities and their power uh, and there's demagoguery around the issue of immigration and then you have perceived troublemakers in the press and congress needs to limit their ability and so i just like i think i may have said to you hody that we should do this book as i read the first chapter just because i was so amazed that the founding generation was doing exactly what like senator uh warner is doing with social media for instance you have, um, you know, Alex Jones, and obviously the the Congress is not re restricting anyone's free speech necessarily, not in the way that they did with Benjamin Franklin Bache, but there is no doubt that con congressional pressure on social media companies to get rid of certain dissenting voices plays a role. Um, so it was it was really. It was. It was just an eye opener to see kind of the parallels between the lead up to the war, to a perceived war with France. Um, you know, France, uh, help refresh my memory, but just to give some people some perspective of what we're talking about, uh, there was a. It, it started under Washington's administration, but then really kind of intensified under Adams' administration where Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, the great villain of the found, early founding, was essentially trying to stoke the fires of war in the United States, saying, we're going to go to war with France. We're going to be drugged into the conflict between England and France. We have French spies here in the United States. We need to uh, limit the amount of Frenchmen in the country, what they can do, how much access they have to certain things, and we need to silence anybody that is remotely sympathetic to the French. And it, Hamilton was using this, uh, this basically raising of the temperature of the society to build a standing army, to grow the size of the central government. Uh, and then he found a competitor in Thomas Jefferson who you know, was not a fan of the central government and, and in a lot of ways felt that every generation of people should have their own version of government, that, the, that you should almost reset the government every 30 years. Um, 
And so what you had was the, were these two factions in Washington's administration that carried over into Adams' administration. Um, you had Thomas Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State, leading the Republicans, very limited government, almost anarchist in a lot of ways. And then you had the Hamilton faction. Hamilton was, I believe, the, he was the Treasury Secretary. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was for a strong central government. And so you had the the Federalists versus the Republicans in the administration. And if you watch HBO's John Adams, you sort of see all this illustrated very well. Um, and eventually Hamilton gets moved out <laughs> and uh, Jefferson leaves the administration. But Adams adopts all of, he keeps on all of Washington's cabinet and his help. And that essentially means that Hamilton's people are instilled into Adams' administration. Well, Adams is halfway between Jefferson and Hamilton and it is stuck in the middle. And so all of Hamilton's people are pushing, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to sign this, you need to limit this. And, and he sees himself kind of... Um, uh, pushed into a situation uh, where he's he's leading, he's trying to avoid a war, but it feels like Hamilton is trying to incite a war. And so the Alien and Sedition Acts were basically limit the ability of aliens in the United States, immigration, and limit sedition by the press from the Republican Jeffersonian side. I mean, it sounds so familiar to our own times where you've got these two factions fighting. We're all stuck in the middle. And then the government does things to limit our ability to be free in society. So it, it, it just, it's just really a well-written book too. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. So that, that's kind of just to set it up for people uh, just to set the frame of what was going on and what the kind of the, time frame of the book is i mean did i get everything right yeah that sounds about, yeah i got about 75 percent of the way through the book I, I never i didn't get, actually finish this one all the way i got distracted <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's all right it um yeah that's that that's that's accurate it's uh it focuses it's funny because you have those founding fathers uh, that everybody knows the Hamiltons, the Jeffersons, Washington, Adams, you know, you got your heavy hitters, but you know, you gradually see that second generation as well seep into the book. Um, Matthew Lyon, uh, Griswold, um, and, and those other, that second generation of politicians kind of, kind of sneak in there. So, um, man, there's a million things to talk about with this book, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about right off the bat is where is the line between being a goofball and being slanderous and being uh, uh, sedition is ridiculous. It's one of they, uh, Christ was actually crucified under sedition. Uh, sedition is the act of trying to seize the crown, essentially take over the government and, you know, make it you know, reform it or change it to do whatever you want with it, which is broad enough to just say, well, isn't, doesn't every new president want to commit sedition? They want to get elected. They want to reform the government in the way that they see it. But on the other hand, they also would try these media people for a sedition because like they're trying to bring it down and really they're just speaking their mind. So Mm -hmm. it's something that, that always struck me. Sedition has always been used out of context. It was used it with Caesar. They used it with Jesus. They, they, and so it's funny that we go through this same thing here by being like, uh, um, I forget his name, but the guy who said, Oh, I hope it shoots him in the ass. You know, the, the cannon shoots Mm. ass and he becomes this famous, you know, he's just some guy who was enjoying a few drinks and he becomes this central character because the guy says that's sedition, sir. Well, no, he's not actually making a legitimate attempt to take over government. He's joking that he hopes the cannons in celebration hit John Adams in the ass because it's funny and he hates him. But they're saying, oh, that's sedition. That's trying to take over the, the, the rulership. Obviously, that's ridiculous. But we got to understand with guys like Bache, and I did a lot of reading about Bache outside the book in the Aurora. Um, I mean, he, he, it, it was beyond Alex Jones. I mean, these guys made Alex Jones look timid. And it's funny because I always thought of Alex Jones as like a modern problem. 
But this is, yeah. I mean, we should explain that Benjamin Franklin Bache was the grandson of Ben Franklin and mm -hmm. spent a lot of time in France and was with Franklin when he was in France and yeah. was, I think, I mean, he was, he was very close to Franklin and, you know, there when he died and he took a lot of his inheritance and he created the Aurora, which was yeah. the, the newspaper that kind of is the central, uh, you know, the central part of this controversy. So when you say he went further than Alex Jones, what do you mean? Well, I mean, we're talking about, he said, uh, Wash okay, so we got to the part where uh, he said Washington had multiple affairs. None of it was true. None of the, all of the women who he said did it were like, no, that's not true. This <laughs> I mean, Hillary probably doesn't eat babies, but. <laughs> right. Well, but now here's where I'm saying it gets crazier because that was addressed in the book. Outside of the book, he talked about like reptiles birthing John Adams, like John Adams being nah. from an egg because he was like, like, I mean, Bates's comments went ridiculous. Jefferson, I mean, this is also outside the book, just research on my own. Jefferson and a whole bunch of other re Republicans in Congress ended up distancing themselves from Bates and the Aurora because, in fact, Benjamin Franklin, while he was, like, dining with Washington, was like, yeah, I don't know what's happened to that kid. Like, he's just gone nuts. I, I have no idea. Like, he's bananas. And so he just, like, starts saying, like, so many of them abandon it. But the thing is, is the Aurora became so popular. It was just such a thing among the people. And so they said, well, you know, the, the problem is then is you say, well, he's clearly none of this is true, but the people are gobbling it up. And so, you know, do we have to draw lines in order to protect the people kind of from themselves? Um, uh, right. Obviously, you and I have, have th thoughts about that, but let, let's give, uh, Hadley, let's give you a chance to jump in here. Um, well, I have thoughts about that. Yeah, the, I think the, 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 a good start to this whole book was the first line was the greatest enemy of liberty is fear. When people feel comfortable and well-protected, they're naturally expansive and tolerant of one another's opinions and rights. When they feel threatened, their tolerance shrinks. Um, and by 1798, that euphoria, euphoria surrounding the uh, revolution kind of died off. I think, and we can see that now, everybody knows humans have a fight, flight, or freeze um, thought process. And I think a lot of people will use that. And if they start getting scared, they're going to be able to, um, strong arm them into doing things they wouldn't normally do like a sedition act at that time. I mean, it wouldn't even be like, no, there's no way we just fought a, a seven year war. I think it was for to get our rights. And now we're going to go and take it with them away. Um, I also like to jump on the part that Chris, you've been talking about the Alien Act. It's so funny to me, the more I've learned, you know, Hamilton, the play, and how much of that seems to be kind of fabricated, but maybe... Revisionist. Let's go with revisionist. We took the biggest scumbag out of all the Founding Fathers and then revised him to look like some sort of great man. And ugh, I read I read the Chernow book, and I just remember hating Hamilton. This was like about 10 years ago. Yeah. But... Yeah, revisionist may be the best way to explain the, but, the, the play. And he was an, an immigrant um, born uh, yeah. down in one of the islands in the Caribbean and immigrated to the United States, completely um, dirt poor, uh, went up from the bottom, and then he gets to the top and he believes he's an aristocrat. And he's starting to try to run the government as if he's some type of high royalty, which just amazes me. Um, and I guess that would go down different. We're not talking about Hamilton, the play. We're talking about this book. Um, so that, you know, surprised me is how much, I know a lot of people change their minds, but how much the, the founding fathers or some of them seem to, as they aged, their, their whole outlook changed on things. Um, I mean, even I talked about in the, in the group, the civility was just lacking was that Bach, is it, is Beish, not Bach, it's Beish, Benjamin Beish. Beish, yeah. I've heard beige, yeah. beige, maybe with a heart like beige. T sound almost, but I've heard yeah. bocce, uh, bocce. Um, yeah, <laughs> they, they named Whatever. That name after him where you try to get the balls close to each other. Yeah. He he's been dead since before your great 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 grandfather, so it's okay. We're fine. Yeah, my my he relatives my relatives not even here yet. Um, so, but I mean, he dies, and literally people are like cheering. I mean, John Adams, I know, basically said like, "Well, it's good that the fever." fever took him because I mean, 
I forget exactly the quote, but it was just, it's kind of like, oh, this is pretty vile. I mean, this is stuff that they're just outwardly honest about, but it's amazing that they even got things done back then the way that they were, they didn't seem to even want to work with each other. Um, I think I went off on a tangent there. And I also, the thing that really, that kind of stuck that was in the beginning of the book was that this bill was signed on the 4th of July. Um, yeah, right. They went home. Even so back then, they wanted to make everything seem so American. Patriot Act, American. Alien Sedition, American. On the 4th yeah. of July. Yeah. The day. So, um, That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, Dale, any thoughts on, uh, any thoughts on the Alien Sedition Act? Yeah, I'm just surprised, I guess, kind of to piggyback and possibly repeat what Hadley said. I'm just surprised that it was even an issue short, so shortly after they had won the Revolutionary War and, you know, fought for freedom of speech because, I mean, under the crown, and it may have gotten a little more liberal by the time the revolution came around, you said anything bad about the king, depending on how bad it was, you're going to you're gonna have a royal troops showing up. Redcoats are going to come get you. And it's just like, it's just one of these things where it's like your 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 heads up your your heads in your hand like wow what what did we just spend the last seven years fighting over, um, and I guess the other thing to piggyback off of what you said um, the whole thing with tying it back to the crucifixion I I kind of knew that Christ had been tried for sedition but the thing of it is he never made any earthly claims um, to um, to what Caesar had even though he had authority overall and just that tie back was very interesting. So could sedition well, here, be an overrated thing? I don't know. It, Pilate well, here's, recognizes here's, it is ridiculous right off the bat. Go ahead, Chris. Right. Yeah. The, the reality to, I've been thinking about this a lot lately and have not crafted it um, in a way that will provoke conservative Christian friends yet, but we'll give you um, a shot here. <laughs> The reality is that the New Testament was written by political prisoners that were executed for challenging the authority of the state. And yet we go to church and we are told, you know, these these like Romans, I think it's Romans 8 or 13, you know, where you're to respect the authority and you have to give render to Caesar unto Caesar. You have all these small verses that conservatives use to coax Christians into supporting whatever the government is doing. Let's go to war in Iraq. But they never actually highlight the biggest fact, which was the Bible was written by people who were uh, set apart from governmental power or, you know, David, even, you know, he was one of the rare examples of somebody who was a king, who was a government authority, but wielded in a certain way. But the New Testament it was written by people that were put to death by their governments for challenging the authority of governments. Uh, you know, Christians, every one of the apostles except for John were executed for challenging the authority of the Sanhedrin and, and Herod and uh, even Roman authority. So the reality is that we as Christians are supposed to provoke and move people away from the idea that problems can be solved by the government and you can, something like abortion is a is a an issue of the human heart it is not something that can be legislated it's not something that can be prohibited it's something that you have to persuade people not to do um so because even if those of us who are pro-life were to try and pass a lot of laws that were pro-life, it's not going to prevent people from taking that action. Same with drugs, same with sex work. You, you cannot, Christ had every ability to make, that's why he was really, if you remember the Easter's coming up and you remember the men who were um, walking the Emmaus road after on the third day, actually, Yep. These were guys who had w had witnessed Christ preach, and they were leaving Jerusalem despite having heard Christ say, I'll be back on the third day. They're leaving Jerusalem, and they're disappointed that the Messiah didn't overthrow the Romans in a, in a warlike, authoritative, build the kingdom on earth sort of way. They, they did, saw Christ, and they didn't get it. So I'm not surprised that a lot of Christians don't still don't get it, but... Yeah. Um, so when you when you loop it back to to this, you're 
you're always going to have people who challenge the state, who challenge prevailing wisdom, who challenge the group. They're always going to be the outcast. They're always going to be persecuted. It doesn't matter if they're true or not. If you're perceived as weird or conspiratorial or um, too far out there or too weird or whatever it may be, you will always be a target by people who want to rein everything in. So, you know, it, it's just a, it's a common theme that we see all through history. You know, the Martin Luthers, the, the Martin Luther King Juniors, the, the people who challenge the authority of the state always end up being alienated and persecuted. Yeah. Well, and, and it's funny because after all this, after all of the hubbub with the Aurora, what ended up being Feitch's downfall, this is another thing that he, he talked a little bit in the book about when, when he got the, the fever, but Feitch and the Aurora was wildly, widely disregarded even before his early death at 29 uh, he actually had to rename the publication because it had such a bad reputation. People realized, started realizing with more media that what he was saying was fake and false. Um, it, it's funny, the, uh, the Reynolds pamphlet, which you, know, you might know from, from uh, the musical of Hamilton, but the Reynolds pamphlet, when, he, when they decided to say, and I don't think it was Beach, but it was the other publication, but they said half of the American history in, in 1789 was Hamilton having an affair. I mean, that was literally 50% of when he was like, let's talk about American history. And then he so badly botched the affair and lied about all the things in it that Hamilton came forward and produced the truth. It destroyed Hamilton's reputation, of course, but also destroyed the newspaper. Beige goes becomes wildly unpopular um, for popularizing it. Um, he actually, at the end of his newspaper, the latest editions of the Aurora before they finally, you know, I, I guess they never closed up chop it. He passed it on to his, his uh, widow. But while he was alive, we're actually slandering his employers for not uh, paying him enough and, and not giving him the right shifts at work and, and being mean to him. Uh, <laughs> and, and so spent a lot of time, you know, making up stuff then about his job. And so it's funny because we do this with uh, Alex Jones. I, I hate talking about the guy, but I thought of him so much when I was reading this because he would put himself out of the mainstream regardless of any law. You know, when you say things like these kids in these shootings are actors or you make up a story about somebody dying on an ambulance because um, because of the protests in the road, you're an asshole. And so him being an asshole would get him discredited. We don't need the media to censor him out. In fact, that makes him look like he's onto something. That makes it look like he's popular. The height of beige is the Alien Sedition Act. And that's when people are like, maybe he's actually onto something. It pushes him into the maybe not mainstream, but popularity. It drives all mm -hmm. this. As soon as they abandon this witch hunt and they finally say, you know what, this was a bad idea, Beach becomes the nobody that he always was. He's an idiot. He loves to make up stuff and lie in order to get his way. And people are finally like, oh, why was I attracted to this? Oh, probably because the government was going so hard and trying to censor it. That could have a lot to do with it. Um, I don't know. Other things to talk about this the, in the book. Uh, I, I don't know. I'll just open up for discussion. I, I could talk about that forever. But uh, Hadley, what's something that you wanted to talk about we haven't really addressed yet? Well, I think jumping off what you're just saying there, um, I mean, by the government going after these people, they created martyrs for the, the general public. So if they didn't do anything, if they just ignored them, most of the time, if you ignore something that's unfalse or just give the, the truth behind it, it's going to go away. Um, I mean, we've, people have probably seen like, uh, falsehoods might be made up about you or your business or something happens, but if you don't give it any legs to run on, I mean, you just let it go or you say your point and move on and let, just let it drop. Most of the time it's just going to fizzle out, but they just kind of incited this whole thing. And I, one of the things that really struck me was how the Federalists structured the bill that it, um, was vol or void null and void the day that their terms ended. So, so it was unless they had the majority again, they wouldn't be able to vote this back in so that it couldn't potentially turn around and take them down because it was, they were using it completely against just the Republicans or the people that weren't agreeing with the Federalists. So it wasn't even, 
it was just a full strong arming of how the government can take, pass a law and whoever is in power, and Hody and I kind of talked about it beforehand, um, is th there's a whole saying, uh, absolute, well, what power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Will you allow certain people to get into power? Um, there's probably plenty of people you've known that might have been in maybe lower management, um, waiters, uh, sales representatives, something like that. You make them a manager and all of a sudden they have power and like the person completely changes. Um, and, and then that kind of goes to their head and it seemed like the handful of these, the, the Federalists at least, it went to their head and they tried to use the power of government to, to get their way. And I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse and going back on the same thing, but it just blew my mind as I was reading through the book nonstop and Dale kind of put it right where you just kind of put your hand on your head and shake it and you go, you thousands and thousands of people died fighting a war so you could have your independence and you go and you just break everything you fought for. Um, you were doing the same exact thing. They put up a Liberty pole, I think in Massachusetts, oh, yeah. was it? Yeah. They put up a Liberty pole, which was a huge thing that the, during the revolution they were doing across towns. Once the British troops come in, they cut down one, two would be there the next day. They took some guy that was basically irrelevant, went from town to town. Nobody even listened to him. Um, but he put up a Liberty pole in one town and then he, he almost became a martyr to the, the cause because they went after this guy that, he ended up getting stuck in jail because he couldn't pay a $400 fine, which I don't know how much that is today, probably hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this guy was just basically a traveling, I don't know, nobody that wanted to spout his opinion. And he was a horrible writer and horrible speaker. Um, but they brought him to light. Just like it was the, he, the guy that was day drinking when Adams came through. Yeah. A, um, uh, he he worked on the river and I guess would bring uh, timber down from upper New York, down downstate, so on and so forth. But just another guy that wasn't doing anything, just out day drinking. And now he becomes known to everybody as well. So um, uh, at least I think, you know, the American public at that point in time wasn't going to have it because we we're like, we just, our sons and daughters and everybody that we know have died to create this nation. You're not going to take it away from us right away. So luckily it was only around, I think, what, three, three years, give or take. Yeah. Oh, uh, 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 Luther Baldwin. That was the name Baldwin. of the guy. It took me a sec. Um, and he, uh, and then what I liked is that the Republicans took over and basically made no mention of it and just kind of, well, allegedly, at least from this author's point of view, it just kind of dissipated. The bill dissipated. They didn't say, ha ha, we beat you. And they just moved on and said, let's, let's, kind of they kind of led by example i would say and, and, and kind of kept moving forward so that was um pretty impactful for me to, sh to see that aspect of it i definitely want to talk about the liberty poll but first things first dale any thoughts about anything we said nothing in particular other than again just how surprising you know just fought a war but yeah no, no, nothing really else to contribute right now. Oh, you're good. Uh, Chris, anything, uh, anything you want us to discuss before you got to take off? Unfortunately, I'd have to run. I'm going to church again. Uh, <laughs> but, but so you no, I two church sessions to take care of. Them. Uh, bro, I'm not, I'm not reformed, but I certainly have a Calvinistic view of myself. So, uh, <laughs> I I just would encourage everybody to read the book. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And if you learn history, then you learning history helps me be so less anxious about the world we're living in. Yeah. Because you see, wow, they did the exact same stuff that we do. And yet look at the difference in America between then and now. Like we, we, we made it still. So uh, I think it's just a great conversation and, uh, definitely a good book. So thanks for hosting Hody and love you guys. And I'll talk to y'all later. Awesome, man. Thanks. Bye. See you later. All right. So you brought up the Liberty Pole, Hadley. That's something that I definitely want to talk about. The uh, Liberty Pole. So it got its history behind um, when Caesar was killed, was when they established the first one. They, they killed him. And they put, they brought out this pole and they put a frigging hat on top of it. It's that little elf hat, the one that Link from Legend of Zelda wears uh, is the best way I could describe it. It's the Santa hat without the white stuff on it. Uh, 
And that was a cap that was symbolic of the people, you know, the, the, the intellectual common man, I guess, is the best way to say it, was, you know, all, all, all the smart commoners were wearing it. And so they put it on a pole and they put it in front of the public and being like, hey, we just killed Caesar. Like, like we did that for you guys. So the power is back to the people. Now, this is another tangent, much like the, the Jesus tangent. I could go on a huge tangent with Caesar because I think I think that's a fascinating episode with like a lot of a lot of twists and turns. Uh, but essentially, Caesar was the last of the Republicans, and after they assassinated him, it was an immediate or not an immediate, but it became an empire after some after I think less than a year. Um, and it's funny because they killed him because they thought he was becoming more imperial. They kill him and they did the exact thing that they became. But they did it on, in this symbol to say, we killed him for you. You guys are, you know, this is our new flag. You know, it's this, I, I don't know if you guys have actually looked up a Liberty Pole. It's this like ridiculously tall, like flagstaff high thing. And then the Phrygian cap just sitting on top of it. So it's like we've replaced like our flag with you, the people, like we're symbolizing that. And that's what it was supposed to symbolize was, was saying, hey, we killed whoever this is, you know, so that we could return power to the people. The reason the Liberty Pole was so divisive in the revolution is they were hypothetically saying, we've killed this person's reputation. We've destroyed, you know, Washington and Adams and we're returning power to the people. Now, the reason that was so awful is one, because of history tells us it's like, well, those guys actually aren't that bad. Adams was instrumental in creating unity for this country. Washington did the exact thing that his enemies said he would never do, which was abdicate the throne, the presidency and his power. They had been constantly, if, if you read the era, um, people barely even knew there was a Federalist Party. They actually thought it was a monarchist party because these these awful publications had. Wait, are you kidding me? They actually. I'm sorry, Hoda. I mean, interrupt. They actually thought it was a monarchist party. They were going to just. They called them monarchists. Oh yep. They called the Federalist monarchists. I mean, and this is why. But see, you're you're. This is appropriate outrage. But you understand that this is why they pushed for the censorship, because they would say they're doing such a disservice to the American people because they don't understand that we just believe that you know, in this limited federal government, which it, I could go off on this too about how Jefferson, the, the Republicans were entirely innocent either. They created this amendment process and then they added a bunch of amendments that added a bunch of power to the constitution that, and so it, it's funny because they said, well, the constitution should be able to be amended. Like, like uh, Chris was saying, every 30 years, every generation or so should reinvent this government in their, in their own image. Uh, not thinking, as the Federalists knew, that, well, they're going to reinvent the government into something much bigger because that's what always happens. And so the Federalists, while you might say those were the big government guys, they were also the, for the side of saying, let's keep the government here. Let's maintain it here. And the, and the Republicans would say, well, no, we need to end up you know, growing it a little bit. But the attack was to call them monarchists. Um, and, and so they would call Hamilton, Adams, um, Washington, up to the point where he finally resigned, the, or, you know, finally, but he resigned the presidency. And they say, you know, they called him a monarchist because they're like, well, this is our new king now. And he's like, I don't even want to be here. You know, you read anything from Washington. He's like, I, I don't want to be here right now. But their attacks was that, well, he ex would accept public ad adulation. Like, he wouldn't condemn people who said he was a good president. L like, it got ridiculous. And so I, I think for me, because I read outside the book, I kind of see it from more of the Federalist perspective. I still think that they were wrong. Uh, but it's, it, I think I see that Federalist perspective having read outside the book. And I understand why the Liberty Pole was divisive. You're basically bragging about assassinating someone's character or literally assassinating them in the case that they did with Caesar. And so that's just what, it made, what made it look so bad. Again, I agree with what you said, Hadley. I'm not trying to make this a bigger deal than it is. I'm explaining why it's controversial. It's still a dumb thing to do. But if you just let it go and have it be a dumb thing to do, I mean, you read the book. The population recognized it was a dumb thing to do. But there was no reason to do anything legally about it. The guy ended up looking stupid. The Democratic Republicans had to distance themselves from him. Just some part of us said the government needs to punish him somehow. And that's the part where it's like, 
but why? His reputation's already been destroyed. People are already distancing themselves from him. Why? Yeah. Yeah, it, well, it seemed like, I think it was, was it Thomas Pickering was the Secretary of State at that point in time who seemed that, to be quite a, let's say, bulldog on, on this law. And, like, they were, he and, I'm blanking on some of the other names. There's uh, so many names, it's hard to remember. I, yeah. I, I remember Bates was the one newspaper guy, but then there was the other one. I mean, there was two others, and I don't remember them, their names either, but go ahead. But it seemed like it was just a handful and like they were, they had to just, they were trying to find anybody and um, it wasn't Pickering. It was another guy, I think that like had almost a little spy network or had, you know, spy citizens that said, you know, let me know if you find anybody doing anything to, uh, that's seditious at all, because we want to make examples of people. And it was almost like they had to go out and find things to, to, um, you know, make people an example of where it actually turned around and hurt him in the end. Um, but I don't know much about Adams, but I was surprised. Um, kind of, he seemed to just not, maybe he didn't have the backbone to be in that type of position. I don't know. I, I don't know much of, of Adams history, yeah. but he just kind of, I think, Hody, it was you or Chris had brought up that he just kind of took on Washington staff mostly. There were some changes. The one thing I know he didn't allow is he did not want Hamilton to be in charge of his army. I think that was the yeah. one thing. He was like, nope, that's that's not going to happen. Um, but he seemed to just kind of go along. But but then there were a few times where he did um, he did make a treaty with the French towards the end, I believe, of his presidency, which mm -hmm. surprised a lot of people because he was pushing so hard almost to. Um, confront them um but a lot of it was to the fact that i think going back to allowing that the federalists did build up the navy and did start taking um uh french ships out that were and allowed the trade routes to open back up again which then decreased insurance rates and made um capitalism back in the day much more affordable to be trading between the islands and in different areas uh so he he did and obviously this, each writer, you have to look at the book from their point of view, or they're going to come across as, you, there's probably a hundred other books that'll show it the other way. Um, but I, I think he did a great job at least of expressing that, at least we have, what was it called, a uh, parchment barrier? Yeah. The final, at least we, we have something in this country that has these laws or these rules that we have, that we're supposed to live by unless those people want to change it. And uh, he said, you know, I'm never going to be afraid in the United States to be arrested for what I say. Um, yeah. And that regard, where in other countries, which are even civilized countries, you know, first world countries, there are laws in place that if you say certain things, you will be arrested and taken to jail. Um, so there's a lot to still hang on that, even though we're dealing with a lot of that uh, back and forth now within our media and, politicians and stuff like that yeah well i mean thank goodness they overturned it um again by popular demand uh lion who you know was the one jailed over sedition uh for spitting tobacco juice and um what uh, uh that other guy that other guy's face basically uh and got in a big fight with him uh, you know, in Congress, <laughs> uh, you know, Lyon, I guess, said he didn't know what session was in at the time. He didn't apologize for spitting tobacco juice all over him. He just was like, oh, I didn't know we were in session. I was just going to, we were going to get into a big fist fight outside. I just, I, I didn't well, know. <laughs> wasn't, it was that, that other guy came back later and tried to romp him over the head with a cane. Beat him with a cane. And then yeah. that's when they got in the fight. It was at a different situation so that's when they both got kicked out but i yeah. think wasn't he, he was taken up on sedition acts because or the sedition act because he had in certain um speeches where he was doing his uh, when he was running around he had quoted a writer out of massachusetts that had said um poor things of adams and stuff like that i think that was one of the main things that they got him on and something else he wrote but then the one yeah. thing he wrote was technically before the sedition act actually went into effect but they still tried it as if it was seditious well, right. I mean, he's an alien, right? And so mm -hmm. this is a big, he was Irish, right? Lion was Irish. And uh, a lot of the people coming to America were these aliens. And the idea was that the, they just don't understand what America was. They don't understand what we put together. One mm -hmm. of the reasons Hamilton was like this, people say, why, how could an immigrant be like this? Is because he 
he was an immigrant himself and was, but you know, and so people say, Oh, would he be in, ha- hypocritical? No, he just understood what he put together said other people don't understand what we put together. It's much the same argument today by people saying, well, if we let these people in, they're going to expand the welfare state. They have no idea. They just think free money comes from America. Those idiots. I have no doubt a small percentage of them may think that, but that does not give us the right then to restrict their movement. Um, A line I did want to read from the book, since we were talking about Adams, because he's such a great guy in in the crafting of America, and then becomes such a terrible president. Like like you noticed, like you noticed, it it said uh, for another politician signing the Sedition Act might have amounted to a political stake, but Adams' signature on the legislation represented a stark personal betrayal of his deepest held beliefs. That. I think we need to take from Adams the great guy that he was when he founded the country and the awful power, you know, the awful temptation of power um, when you, when you consolidate it too much, you know, Mm -hmm. being able to silence your enemies, even if your enemies are saying ridiculous things like that you were hatched from an egg um, that, Oh, what's it? I was reading them through and they were hilarious. Like it's like Alex Jones in level of comedy almost. You know, I'm sorry that some people took it so seriously. And there's no doubt like 1% of the people that believe in Alex Jones, but it's got to be small. And I can't imagine that people actually thought that Adams was like, um, what, like planning on giving the whole country over to Britain was one of the things they, they popularized about him. Um, you know, ready, ready to, to sign us back over, like in an official capacity and become part of Britain again. I mean, th- th- these are obviously things that Washington and Adams would have never done. I mean, Washington was the general of our army, for goodness sake. Uh, but, but, you know, they, they carried weight. And so you just say, is this language dangerous? Might something happen from it? This actually leads into the next thing I wanted to talk about. You'll remember that they wrote that they said, okay, the freedom of speech shall not be amended or abridged and neither shall the freedom of, uh, the, freedom of the press be abridged. But the guys who wrote it, <laughs> you know, cause I find this to be a modern argument. We say, well, what were they thinking when they wrote it? Well, even they started disagreeing with each other because they say, well, we said the freedom of speech will not be amended or abridged, but we only said the freedom of the press will not be abridged. We didn't say anything about amended. So that gives us, they wormhole, you know what I mean? They worm their way in there to say, uh, oh, we can abridge, we can amend it then. We can't abridge it. He can say whatever he wants, but maybe he can't publish it. And I think they, they went on the aspect of uh, Congress, what the First Amendment Congress shall make no law respecting uh, an establishment of a religion or prohibiting free exercise thereof. Yeah, um, yeah or abridging the freedom. So, right. But basically, so they, they came back and said that, well, we're not doing anything with religion, which we said we can make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Yeah. Uh, but there is some gray area here, like you were mentioning, uh, on the speech uh, or the, uh, the press. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was very interesting. And some said, no, that's not what we talked about uh, just a few years ago, but no, no, what we're saying. Yeah. Let's not restrict this. Let's also not restrict that. Oh, unless those people really hate me. Right. In which case, then I'm going to take an extra hard look at those words. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Dale, I'm sure you can think of some examples where we've, uh, (laughs) we've been doing a bit of that. Where we have been, where we have been trying to suppress people, like as libertarians. Oh or? no, no, no! Uh, I shouldn't say we. They. <laughs> <laughs> they. They have been doing that. Yeah, I. It, you know, the the thing on guns. Not to necessarily bring that up during book club, but you know, shall not be infringed, and yet you know you have, you know, bump stocks and magazine limits, and you know you have to go through. You could probably buy an automatic weapon, but you have to go through all sorts of licensure to get to it. It might as well be actually illegal. Um, you know, getting down. Well, I could go on a, another rant about my warning that I had. You know, being able to you know drive freely on the road, and I'm not causing property damage, even though I have a headlight out. But you know, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's fair. I mean, that's that's exactly the kind of situation that we're in. Is we're saying, I mean, you look at the police are a good example. Protect and serve. How much of their job is actually protecting and serving? How much of it is fundraising? I mean, I think we all know the answer to it, 
and it's embarrassing. But we take something that says, we'll protect and serve. And it's like, we're going to have you serve in this really weird way. And we're going to use some weird verbiage in order to get that to count as service. And, and it's just, it, it's just been so manipulated that it's hard to get back to where we were trying to get to be, to begin with. And it, it's a tough place. I, um, I really, I really feel strongly uh, especially after reading the book, uh, that we just need to let everybody talk and let the cards fall where they may. Mm-hmm. I think that, and, and, and granted the founding fathers when they set up the country, so this is constitutional, was like, hey, slander is not cool. You can't like destroy somebody's reputation with lies that cost them financial gain. The thing is, is I would contend that because I'd say, I don't, I don't know that we can accurately, accurately stop that. At what point do I say something that costs someone money or wages or reputation damage? It, it, you can really worm around that. You can, you know, just talk about providing a loophole. The slander loophole is to just say, I mean, yes, there's beach. Talking about being hatched from an egg is an obvious lie. Doing damage to the Adams presidency you know, because you got a lot of people to believe in it, probably not the majority, but enough idiots to believe in it, he could absolutely be on the hook for doing damage to somebody else's occupation, in this case, Adam's presidency. But the accountability, I think the the problem is, is if we try to protect slander, there's no end. If I say, well, somebody called me a name on Facebook and I run a restaurant and now less less people are coming into my restaurant, well, then I have to investigate whatever the claim is, whether it's true or not. There's no end. It just gets, for me, it just gets too crazy. There's no stopping it. Well, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Hody. I I didn't mean to interrupt. I I, I had no follow-up. I was just going to keep rambling. Go ahead. Well, what what I'm thinking is, okay, on a federal level, Freedom, absolute freedom of speech, obviously. But then you also need to one one also needs to think about state to state and even within localities. And then what about the aspect of bringing a civil suit? The thing of it is, we 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 and I was talking with someone after church um, about this. So oftentimes we try to lump government into this big big blob. Getting back to you know the the union of the states. It was it was a collection of states that formed our country. Well, the states within within their their zone of control so to speak can you know, can set up can pretty much do whatever they want you have to make sure that it's within the within their constitutions to protect free speech and then you know let there be slander and libel laws or not it within those within those states and you know um granular different granular levels of of government and even just don't even have slander and libel laws just like a reputation lawsuit. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's just I'm just spitballing at this point, but it just made me think of that, bringing it to a more local way of thinking. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's that's true. Go ahead, Hadley. Yeah, kind of a defamation of character type situation where somebody does come and and attacks you unwrongly, which it could actually be type of almost like a physical force because if they are attacking you in a certain way, and it's degrading your reputation off of complete lies. I mean, I guess there's, that's where you get, you go, but I think Dale's talking about a little bit. It's like, how do you, how do you protect yourself on that, on that aspect? Um, if anybody can say, and, and, and will say anything. See, for me personally, I just say strip all the protections. And I, I mean, I would be fine with decentralizing it like Dale said, but I think that the winning, the winning formula you know, if we were to let these ideas compete, you know, versus, you know, slander and and all that, if we were to make them compete, I think the winning one is just to let to say everybody can hear and say whatever they want. And that way that puts the ownership clearly on the individual to say, okay, I've got a bunch of information here. I got a bunch of people talking, you know, I think this guy's talking smack. And that, that way in this society, we say, well, I'm not just going to believe everything that I see because it's completely unregulated and so anybody can say anything with that knowledge that it's unregulated means that i have to trust my sources and then you develop a system that says these are the sources that i trust these are the ones that are ridiculous as opposed to just saying this is a government sanctioned source you know what we have now is a situation where uh what with the national association of media broadcasters is i know they're like top 20 in people that bribe the government 
You know, I, 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 I talk about this list all the time, but they push for all these licensing to be a credentialed member of the media. Problem is, credentials mem- members of the media have had some real problems with honesty over the past few decades here. It's not a new problem. It's a problem that we've always had. But there's nothing keeping them, you know, they get these licensing and then they get the licensing and then they decide still not to be honest. So it doesn't matter. It just lends them that authority of saying, well, you know, we are this mainstream. I mean, now mainstream media is a joke. People say mainstream media and they know it's a joke. So the fact that you go through this licensing really just makes it more expensive to be a member of the media, but it really hasn't accomplished anything that they wanted to accomplish aside from saying you can't be a member of the media because you're not licensed regardless of whether you're telling the truth or not it's suppression it's censorship and that's what it's ended up turning into these are the this is the early iteration this book is the early iteration of that by saying do we need to suppress them i like the conclusion that we they ended up going to by saying no but we still use those same loopholes that they used back then to create new stuff today they had the alien sedition act back then now we just have pretty much straight up bribery today with the uh, Association of the Broadcasters and the licensed uh, credentialed, I guess, journalists and, and broadcasters. But it's the same problems, you know, and we, they keep using the same ambiguous language. I don't think the language is that ambiguous when you say we're not going to abridge it, but they want it to be so that they can silence whoever their opposition is. Right. I mean, did anybody do more damage to the Washington Post reputation than the Washington Post itself? Probably not. No way. You know? Mm-hmm. No way. I mean, it's just, it, it, to me, it's just that obvious. But, uh, yeah. Anyhow, I, I like the book. I, did, I will say this. I feel like he could have talked about more. I, don't, I know that would have made the book longer. I love that he introduced some new characters. It definitely makes the Federalists... He doesn't present, I guess, what would be their best argument. You know, I think there was a strong, if you even read the the numbers from the Continental Congress, you see that the Federalists have this voice of saying, if you let people change the government, they're going to grow it. And the Federalists had the biggest problem with that growth. I would say the Federalists were right in that aspect. I also believe that the Republicans were right. We, all, we do need an amendment process if there is going to be some type of federal government. I understand. I, I don't, I'm not trying to take sides either. I think that I, I, in my own heart, understand where both Adams and Jefferson and Washington and Madison, when they would fight in Congress, I understood exactly what they were fighting about. I'm one of the few people that's read it all because I love them. But I also... I I can't come to a conclusion over who is more right because yes, we ended up going with the amendment process. I mean, literally we we get the 10 amendments saying, okay, here's things we'll never do. And then starting amendment number 11, here's stuff we're going to mess up for you. You know, (laughs) I mean, they almost immediately fail by adding this amendment process. In that case, that made the Federalists look spot on. Now the Federalists lost the argument, of course, so it's hard for me to say, but hypothetically looking back on it, it's also hard for me to say that the Federalists were right um, entirely by saying, because if you keep the government, you know, we say as is, no amendment process, trying to keep it small, you look at that same language. And even though they tried to be as clear about it as they could, they still say, well, technically we can do all these awful things. And it's impossible for me to say, especially looking that the same people use abusing the amendments wouldn't just go ahead and abuse a different system. You know, nowadays we have problems with a court ruling being an egregious violation of the constitution and what it was promised, but it's hard to say that, you know, without that court ruling, they wouldn't have just, you know, that, that some governor wouldn't have just stepped in and said, well, they said I can't am- am- uh, abridge it, but I'm going to amend it or I'm going to treat it this way. And, and so, for me, I see both sides of the story. I think it definitely presents the best argument for the Democratic Republicans. I think Adams is right that his, I mean, his presidency was a failed presidency, whether you're libertarian, Republican, Federalist, Democrat, heck, probably even monarchist. You probably thought he didn't do very well. Um, <laughs> even the fictitious monarchist probably didn't like him. Uh, but the, you know, a, as president, he didn't do very well. And I think that's fair. And, and I think he does a good job in making it making you understand where Adams would come from. I still think that 
he kind of painted them as strong or big government, which really was not the argument of the Federalists. But that would be the only, I guess, detraction I have from the book. I think he did do his best to present both sides. And at, at very least, even if he didn't present both sides' arguments very well, like I'm saying, he presented both of their mentalities very well by saying, here's where I'm coming from and here's where my ideas are at. But those are kind of my, I guess, my closing thoughts on it. I guess we don't have to close now, but if you have something else that you wanted to talk about or, or, or something you wanted to say, Hadley, I'll turn it over to you. I think I could close up on it as well. I've pretty much brought up everything that I wanted to. Um, I guess I agree because I don't know. My, my history is not that strong. Um, so the, the Federalist point of view that you've done a little more research on, Hody. Um, so from that, I mean, he did not, he definitely made it seem as if the Federalists were more towards big government wanting to control, but maybe that was also because he did kept bringing up Hamilton and some of them that thought that, and I think that was originally Hamilton's thought was we will elect people to Congress, but they're brought in not by the people, but by a select minority of people that will choose who they are. And then they, they are there for life which didn't happen luckily because <laughs> I mean, well, actually it does happen. And so there's plenty of people in there for life at this point in time. Um, so I, I don't, I didn't get that whole part of it. So obviously it looked like he came from his whole, the writer's part was coming from more the, he was in favor of the Republicans view, obviously. Um, but it, it was, it made me think a lot more. Uh, I think, this book club has been great because every book I've read, I'm like, Ooh, I've got to read this book now or this book. And then, yeah. um, uh, I was listening to Tom Woods and he had a whole podcast on the books that he, he recommends and so on and so forth. So it, unfortunately I can't read fast enough. And I did just finish this last night, Hody. So even though oh, nice. I did get a jump on you, uh, I, I, I did just finish it last night. That's okay. Uh, Bradley, so, don't feel bad. I didn't even read it. And I, barged in on the conversation <laughs> well you, you took paul's spot this this month um you know he came in last month um but uh i i did like how i mean it does it does bring back to where we're at today um isn't really that bad i mean this stuff has been going on for yeah. hundreds of years where people are on opposite sides i think at least at the beginning i believe personally that the founders um, kind of had all the same mentality. I mean, obviously most of them lived through the revolution. So you, you were there for that mm -hmm. um, where I think we're a little bit more <laughs> on opposite ends today. Uh, yeah. But the same slander, slander lish or can't talk uh, mud slinging that's been happening back then is happening now. And it's just different. And we're probably more privy to it because you pick up your phone and it's there. Um, where back then you had to go to an Aurora or any of those other newspaper outlets and, um, and actually reach it out. So yeah. it's, it's more in your face now and you can get taken by it. Um, so I, I truly, I enjoyed the book. It made me think a lot more um, about what was going on back then and, and how government literally from the get go was trying to go back on what they already, they just put into place. Yeah. The guys so, who wrote it didn't agree on what they wrote. Crazy. Right. So, um, and I did like the last part, the last chapter, I kind of mentioned the parchment barrier where um, we do have rules set in place that are there that other countries don't, that are technically free countries um, to an extent, but their rights can be abridged much easier mm -hmm. than those of the U.S. So that's kind of a, a good feeling. True. Uh, Dale, any, any thoughts that you want to have? And then don't, don't disconnect because actually we have one more thing to talk about. I know we said closing thoughts, but there's one more thing, one more item okay. of business. No, uh, the, what you piggybacking off of Hadley, I keep pointing like I'm pointing like he's next to me. I but, try to do um, the same thing. Piggybacking off of Hadley, um, one of the, uh, nothing is new under the sun. I mean, kind of tying it because we've kind of mm -hmm. touched the biblical landscape of things. I mean, we've been doing, we've been being human for 10,000 plus years and you know, arguing with each other, fighting with each other. I mean, human nature isn't, isn't going to change a whole lot unless you bring intentionality and reason to bear on it. I mean, regardless of the, you know, the, whether it's David versus Absalom all the way to, you know, the Federalist versus the Anti-Federalist. I mean, it, it sounds like it's a big insight into human nature on a, on a macro level. That's, that's my closing thought. 
I, I would say that's such a good closing thought because that's almost the point of the book. <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh, so let's talk. Uh, we actually, Chris just wanted to put it to a vote. He didn't want to make an uh, executive decision this month um, on the next book that we wanted to read. Um, I'll read just about anything, but is there something that's been picking your brain that you wanted to read? Um, are you in a place where you can check our bookshelf, Hadley? On the, yeah, I, I looked at it last night and I took a few screenshots of the oh. one I'm looking at. Okay. So you is got that good reads? Knowledge. That's good. Yeah, it's good reads. No, it's just called the We Are Libertarians Book Club. We're not too hard hard to find. But um, well, I was gonna I was gonna make an off the shelf suggestion. There's a uh, a book that I just put on my shelf called the uh, Slang and Euphemism Dictionary, and it's basically a uh, if we want to talk about free speech. It's a dictionary of, of bad cuss words from the uh, from the 1800s to uh, to I think maybe the uh, late 80s, and it's pretty exhaustive. I actually went through and read the thing, and uh, it's just it's there's no plot, there's no uh, it's just a dictionary, but everything is it's hilarious. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> a lexicon of improper English from slang terminology describing various bodily functions and sexual acts <laughs> to the centuries old cant of thieves and prostitutes to the language of modern drug culture. I just mucked up Sunday's podcast. Here are 14,500 entries and 32,000 definitions of all the words and expressions so carefully omitted from standard dictionaries and polite conversation. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Your your mind is so much more polluted knowing that knowing that you have read fourteen thousand five hundred entries about <laughs> about slang. That's I hilarious. actually haven't read through the whole thing. I, I was reading like a page or two a night or something like that, and uh, I think I lost it, and then I thought it was gone, and then found it again recently. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, any of them, any of them look enticing to you there, uh, Hadley? Um, you can even give yes. me a list and I can pick from the list if you want. I mean, I, I don't know how we do want to do this joint. So yeah. I, I just got, I just chose a couple that um, kind of piqued my interest. One is off the shelf. Um, just cause I got this recently, recently is the catcher in the rye. Oh. I, th I probably read the cliff notes in high school to get a buy with a paper at some point. Um, yeah. but, uh, I would not, I'm not what you would have called a, a, a very stupid back in the day. Uh, but the other ones were The Road to Serfdom, uh, Orwell's The Animal Farmer, 84, 1984, and also Ron Paul's The Revolution and Manifesto. I have not read any of those, and those are kind of ones that just popped off um, on there. Because there's some other ones, but they're like, you know, the um, – who, there's a couple that are seven, eight hundred pages and yeah. a little bit more in depth that I personally will not be able to read within a 30 day time frame. So, um, man, so, so let me think through here. Cause, okay. So we just finished reading a manifesto. So let's maybe mm -hmm. wait, wait yeah. on that one. I love the Ron Paul probably more than a lot of people in the libertarian party just because i know he's like got that paleo thing going on and and uh, the pro-life stuff and and everything like that but i think he's he's a an effective communicator and somebody who sticks by his principles so I, I like him um i i love the catcher in the rye so any book your high school teacher made you read i have probably read i that actually was my first love of reading i had a really good high school teacher and just systematically went through. Uh, it was actually the AP list um, for for, uh, for for you know. There's a list for for the books that you can cite in uh, in there. And I went through and I was like, I got to read all of these. And so if it's on that list, I've probably read it. I love those books. I love Catcher in the Rye. It's definitely not libertarian, but I think again, that's part of the point of this book club is just to mm -hmm. talk about different ideas. And, and there's a ton of ideas packed into that book and it is not big. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, the books your high school teacher read, made you read and they think crime and punishment or as I lay dying, um, which people love to call as I die reading. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I love those books, but I also understand they're lengthy. The Catcher in the Rye is a short 
by all, all, all it's only like 250 or something like that no it is yeah it, it you can fly through it um i don't know okay, if i want to do you want a serious suggestion i just reviewed i just reviewed the book list do you want a yeah. serious suggestion from me I yeah go ahead what a few you're looking at either please understand me too uh temper temperament character and intelligence or the crowd a study of the popular mind um and i'm looking at that second one for selfish reasons because part of my whole theme is trying to do a flip on the collective psychology to remove people back to individualism but i've just never understood how people can be stupid <laughs> so yeah. it looks like it would be a book that would be insightful into that but no i love those i love those self-help books as well um I guess for me, I'm leaning towards the road to serve them because I have not read it. And I know it's like core libertarian literature. You know what I mean? It, it's right there with like Atlas shrugged in the law, you know? Uh, and, and I haven't read it. Have either of you two read it? No, no. It's Hayek. So I assume there's going to be a lot of economics into it, which makes me love it even more. <laughs> but Hayek and then what resurrected by Milton Freeman and everything. So uh, let's do that one. Let's do the road to serfdom. I do want to add more and I know I'm falling back. I'm, you know, Dale, I even told you I have this problem where I'll read an economics book over a self-help book all day and the self-help books are probably what I need more. But, hey Cody, road yeah. to serfdom is not on the list in the, in the yeah. shelf. It's on, uh, it's on there twice, I think. It's, uh, let's see, if you're looking at pages, it is page five. Fourth oh, wait. One, fourth oh, okay. one from the bottom. You're good. <laughs> um, and, and Hody, one thing I'd like to say is usually what I like to put is and it's not self-help, it's personal development. Oh, okay. Everybody will say, oh, it's self-help, you know, you, you need, like, what's wrong with you? Like, no, no, no I'm, I'm developing. And because uh, I don't, I think that's a, I also like personal development books and a lot of them revolve around business or leadership or other aspects. but. Um, you know, without those books, I wouldn't be where I am today for without a doubt. Cause those started changing my mindset on many different levels, um, for the much, for the better, of course. Yeah. But. Um, I don't know. I mean, do either of you feel passionately enough that that should not be the book next month and that we should do a different, I one? need to read it. I mean, this probably yeah, won't, too. this probably won't be okay. So let's do that one. Um, but keep those books in mind next time. Chris has it, has us put it to a vote. Let's, let's, remember the books we just said and keep those on the, uh, the list there. I would, I would love to do Catcher in the Rye. I don't know if I could shut up about it enough to let you guys talk. No, that's, that's my worry, but, uh, you'll have to give one of us the mute button then. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys host? And they'll be like, all right, Hody, that's enough, buddy. I'm sorry. Two, two, you get 30 <laughs> seconds, Hody. <laughs> I do what I do during the debates, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only two minutes. That question's for you. Uh, uh, <laughs> watch me suffer. Uh, awesome. Well, hey guys, it was great hanging out with you again. I love doing this every month. Um, I'm sorry we missed some of the others because I know they read the book, so it's too bad. But uh, again, if you are listening to this, it means you are a Patreon donor because this is only accessible to our Patreon donors. Thank you so much for supporting this program. We, uh, we of course encourage people to help the we are libertarians network in any way they can whether it's liking leaving a good review sharing honestly my currency is just personal feedback if you say something nice about the way i'm doing i feel like a million bucks so but what really makes it run in all practicality it's the money and we need it and we're just so grateful that you guys have been uh, able to give it to us and keep this network going and and getting that message out there it helps me keep those, uh, keep the debates there, uh, and public, you know, and, and that's a, that's been great for everybody. Um, and I just wanted to thank you so much for doing that. So again, thank you for listening and, uh, join us again next month. We'll talk to you guys later.